Siblings and sisters and brothers in faith, welcome to Tuesdays for Nurture. This is a webinar series where we faithfully focus on education for the people of God. Our topics include faith-filled politics, interviews of key leaders, and how-tos in congregational life, each impacted by the realities of life today on church. And every program will feature suggestions about what you can do to change the church and the world towards the world God imagines for all of us. So this series is called The State of the Matter, originating from the theme of the State of the Union Address coming, uh, which occurs around this time. And there are often goals about what's happening in the first hundred days and framing the work going forward. And yet, people often abdicate their power to the people in the seats. And it has become clear that the power is with the people. The questions become not only, but also, not only what, was, what must we demand of this administration, but also what must we demand of ourselves? Therefore, this and several others in series will engage leading voices to usher us into conversation and deep thought about our responsibility and our accountability in the changing from who we are to who we want to become. All of the State of the Matter addresses are recorded and they will be available to engage as a group thereafter. Our hope is not in the White House, but in God and in the people and our collective responsibility to make this nation what it can be. So without further ado, I want to introduce the Reverend Tracy Blackman to lead into this conversation. Amen, Dr. Davies, and good afternoon, everyone. We are so excited and delighted that you have chosen to join us today for our webinar series. Today, we will address the state of Black bodies in America, the state of Black bodies in America. And I am thrilled to have as our guest today, Dean Kelly Brown Douglas. As the inaugural Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary, Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas leads the development of EDS at Union, which allows students to fulfill their requirements for ordination in the Episcopal Church while receiving their degree from Union Seminary. Prior to become, coming to Union, Dr. Douglas was the Susan D. Morgan Professor of Religion and Canon the Theologian at Washington National Cathedral. And previously, she was Associate Professor of Theology at Howard University School of Divinity, Assistant Professor of Religion at Edward Waters College. A leading voice in the development of womanist theology. I tell you that I became a big fan of Dean Douglas with her groundbreaking and widely used book of sexuality and the black church, a womanist perspective and her book, Stand Your Ground, which helped me in so many ways survive the trauma of Ferguson. Black Bodies and the Justice of God examines the deep roots of, of a stand your ground culture in America and the challenges it brings to the black church community. And I would suggest the challenges it brings to the entire world. It is as though the spirit knew that we would need to talk to Dean Douglas at this particular time in our history, as we are all watching with bated breath, the trial that is unfolding in Minneapolis with officer Derek Chauvin and the state sanctioned, I say, execution of George Floyd. I can think of no better voice to speak to us in this moment at the intersections of all the things that we have to talk about and with such clarity around our faith response to the injustices we see. We're going to be in conversation with Dean Douglas today with Dr. Velda Love, who is our Minister for Racial Justice. I'm delighted that Dr. Velda wanted to engage D Dean Douglas in this way. And so I'm gonna be listening from the background, learning from these two brilliant scholars, and so excited about what we're going to hear. Without further ado, welcome Dean Douglas, welcome to the United Church of Christ webinar series, and welcome Dr. Velja today. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Reverend Tracy. 
thank you so much, Reverend Tracy, uh, for inviting me in to this conversation. And thank you for your leadership in uh, uh, the United Church of Christ and your leadership as one of the leading uh, voices that is really holding us all accountable uh, to the work that must be done if we are ever to reach that future where black lives in fact matter. Uh, and so thank you so much for making me a part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it is a pleasure to work with Reverend Tracy Blackman and everyone at the United Church of Christ to offer this opportunity for us to engage with you, uh, Dean Douglas. And so tell me a preference. I'm always, um, identity is very important, especially when you come as a person of African descent to be able to name yourself. And so I'm inviting you, um, how do we name you this afternoon? Well, you always, I, first of all, thank you. And it's so good to see you again and be with you. And, and you know how much I admire the work uh, that you do in your journey. And so I always say, uh, I've always experienced uh, from you and others that you have uh, caught up on me with respect. So I do not have any worries about that. And, uh, and so please, uh, uh, call upon me and name me the way in which you are comfortable uh, because we are here as sisters and siblings on the journey. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'd like to open um, just to give us some framing about our conversation today and the state of Black bodies. And what does that mean for you in this moment as we are moving uh, through the 21st century, but so much chaos and so the ongoing historical markers around Black bodies. What does that mean for today? Yeah, thank you for, for that question. And oh my goodness, uh, uh, such an easy but complex and, 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 and deep question. Let me begin by uh, saying this, when we talk about the state of black bodies, particularly uh, where we find ourselves in this, in this current moment. And we know that over this uh, past year, as the health pandemic that was COVID began to emerge, that for some people, it laid bare right? The realities of an often ignored and ongoing pandemic in this country, which was the pandemic of, of white supremacy. And, and this, as we say, what laid bare for some, but not for those who uh, were on the underside and impacted by the realities of white supremacy. And so what we know is that the comorbidities that made uh, black bodies more susceptible in disproportionate numbers to the virus that was uh, COVID or the comorbidities that come with living under a nation that has been founded upon, grounded in, and that has white supremacy right in its founding DNA in the fabric of the nation. So that it is time to begin to declare its long past time to declare white supremacy a health emergency, a national health emergency in this country. Because the state of black bodies are that black bodies have for far too long been trapped in these crucifying realities uh, that are indeed, as we say, the comorbidities of white supremacy. What do I mean by these crucifying realities? Well, you know, black bodies have disproportionately been trapped in conditions that promote and foster death, not life. And so whether we're talking about the realities, for instance, of, 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 of poverty in which black bodies are disproportionately trapped, these realities, these conditions, which I call crucifying realities are meant 
They're doing their job. They are meant indeed to not enhance life, but indeed to in fact negate life. And so for far too long, we have been trapped into the, in these conditions and that which COVID laid bare to some have been the state of black bodies in this nation since this nation's founding because this nation was founded upon a white supremacist sort of identity, right? And so that has been the state of affairs. Now, when you bring that together with an anti-Black narrative that is also defined uh, as a part of this nation's uh, founding identity. Well, there indeed, that's when you find that Black bodies, Black life in this nation has always been moving against the grain of what their lives were intended to be in this daggone nation. And so that's where we are. Now we can talk about what that looks like and particularly and how in fact uh, we uh, can perhaps move forward in that. But I think the starting foundation is to understand that. And that until it's not simply naming white supremacy, it's declaring it a national emergency. It's declaring it a national health crisis because it is. Thank you, thank you, very powerful um, indeed. And so um, the framing that you have laid out for us as this crucifying reality. And so we've just left the season of Lent. We have just left the resurrection of Jesus, this radical Jesus. So can you um, talk about this, the space of the church and also being able to declare the narrative of the crucifying realities, because oftentimes we find the church wants to stay locked right. <laughs> or trapped in traditionalism. And so how do we engage the church, move the church forward with a more radical understanding of these crucifying realities? Yes, yeah, so here's, th thank you, here's, here's, Yes, and, and we have to hold in, in, in tension now because we're <laughs> in the season of, of, of Easter. Uh, the, yeah, for yeah. Episcopalians, uh, Easter is a season. Uh, uh, and, and so we're, but you can't get to Easter. And this is what becomes important. And this is what becomes important to our faith tradition uh, as Christians. You know, we have a crucified savior a cross at the center of our faith tradition, the only faith tradition that has that. And we need to act like it and we don't. And so what does it mean to act like that? That we have a crucified savior at the center. And first thing that we need to know of course is that Jesus uh, wasn't crucified because he prayed too much. It uh, may be because he prayed that he was able to go to the cross, but he wasn't put on the cross because he prayed too much. Jesus was the hit that he was crucified. First of all, of course, reveals his utter solidarity with the crucified classes of people in his day. And so the church must find itself in utter solidarity with the crucified classes of people in our time of our time. Now, what, what, what does that mean? And before I get, say that, what that also indicates for us is that the only way toward justice, and that's what the cross tells us, you got to go through the cross, you got to go through those people who have been on the crucifying realities of injustice. It's only when they say, that, wow, that's justice, that we even know we're on the ark that bends toward justice. Otherwise, those folks that have enjoyed the privileges of an unjust system, the privileges of a white supremacist system will begin to confuse their privilege with justice. But those people who have not enjoyed any privilege will instead will never do that. They'll, they'll recognize justice. We don't recognize justice. So the church's first call is to be in utter solidarity with those persons who are on the underside of justice in this country, those persons trapped in crucifying realities. And so that means that, you know, you got to, you, 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 you ask, you listen. And, and, and what is it? What is it that we are withholding from a people that we would never withhold from ourselves? 
else, right? Mm -hmm. To me, that's 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 the. So, do you want do you want food on your table? Would you want uh, withhold it from another? We people trapped in crucifying realities don't have enough food, the, the resources to provide for life, for life. And so that's that's where where we began, and that's where the movement toward justice begins. It begins in, 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 in those realities. The church needs to be there. The other thing, so we're accountable to that because we're accountable to the cross. On the other hand, you got these two tensions now, right? We are accountable not to our present realities of not simply injustice, but not to the way in which we can imagine justice. I'm gonna get to that in a minute, but we are accountable to God's more just future, period. So that's what should drive us, right? This accountability, what it means to be a people of faith is to, when we say we believe or we're people of faith, that is saying yes, to partnering with God to mend the earth so that it just gets a little bit closer to the future that God promised us all. So you've got these two poles. The cross reminds us that we gotta, we gotta be accountable. We gotta be in utter solidarity with those people on the very undecided that, that are trapped in crucifying realities. And then on the other hand, that our vision, our vision uh, for justice has to be com uh, it's compelled by our accountability to God's more just future. Those are the two things. We are not accountable in any regard to the way things are, or, and this is the last thing I'll say, or to the moral imaginary that emerges from the way things are. No, and that's the role of people of faith to open up the moral imaginary of what is possible, to open up the moral imaginary of what justice looks like. And that is defined, right, by our accountability to God's future where there will be no first, there will where the first or last and last or first, not because there's a reversal of fortunes, but because there will be no first, there will be no last, because everybody will be treated and respected as the sacred human beings that they are. Now, on the human side of that, how do we know we're on that arc that bends toward that kind of justice? because the people on the very underside trapped in crucifying realities began to say, that looks like justice. And that's when we know, when they began to say, ah, that looks like, when they began to be able to be freed from these crucifying realities that pretend and promise their death. So when, they're, when they, are able to, to have the opportunity for their lives to flourish so that they, they have a decent place in which to live, that they have a, a enough food to feed their bodies, that when they have the opportunities of not simply education, but to expand their own realities and vision. Because when you're hungry, you can't, you know, we have the luxury of talking about a vision. When you're hungry, you're just trying to get food. Uh, to when they have the opportunity to expand their visions of the possibilities for their life, then that's when we know that we are at least, we, at least on the arc, right? That bends toward justice. Don't let, I, I'm going on. You asked me one little question. <laughs> but it's but it's no, but it's yes it's, it's that's powerful. the tension yeah. of 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 being uh uh from a faith tradition with a cross at its center but it doesn't stop there the cross never has had the last word and if we are people of and we have to live into the fact that it doesn't have the last word even as we know until we take the crucifying realities of our context seriously we will never ever get to the new life, which is, is the resurrection that, that we are all promised. Thank you, thank you. Just to be able to open the conversation up and to see your passion, but also what does it mean to have this kind of vision? How, um, so we're looking, when the people see that the arc, 
Yes, when the people see the arc of justice is now actually bending in their favor, their vision becomes God's vision, right? That openness, that freedom. Um, how do we in human flesh um, enact that, be that? Right. No, you know, so what does that look like practically, right? Because, yes. you know, we can talk as, as King used to say, be so heavenly uh, bound that we are no earthly good. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, and so thank you. What does that look like? How do we get on the ark? You know, what does it look like to, to be on the ark in practical purposes? Look, you know, Here's what I think we talk about. You had talked about, or, or uh, Reverend Blackman, these sort of first hundred days in this administration, and and so what's the movement? How can the church push, uh, uh, push us to be a nation that is in some way freed from uh, the culture of sin that is white supremacy? Right, that's original sin. Original sin is about being. Uh, trapped in a culture of sin and we are trapped in the culture of sin that is white supremacy. So the first thing, uh, of course, that I think is required, as I said, is that we have to force the nation to, the, as we are in this health pandemic, to declare white supremacy itself a national health emergency. And we have seen on all levels how that is the case. Right. And we have certainly seen that as we've seen the way in which COVID has interacted uh, with white supremacist realities in this nation, leaving people of color uh, and particularly black people uh, and First Nations people more vulnerable uh, to not only the, uh, getting the disease, but dying from the disease. Why? Because why die? Because we don't have access uh, to healthcare, et cetera, and other, other kind of things. It is a national health emergency. It's a national health emergency, even in the ways in which uh, we can't see, uh, in the way in which uh, it impacts. We talk about these comorbidities of high blood pressure and all of that. Well, we know that, in fact, these levels of living under these traumatic, condi traumatizing conditions that are white supremacy lead to those kind of things. So that's, that's the one level, and we could go on and on, but we have to force that it's called uh, a, a, a national health emergency, even as we recognize in the faith community that it's a sin. Uh, uh, and, 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 and sin creates its own centrifugal force pulling people in. The other thing that we do is that, so that, you know, you've named it. Now, how do you diagnose it? How, how do you begin to understand it? I think it's time. This nation is always putting together task force, everything else. Uh, it is time for this nation to put together a task force to try to indeed diagnose and come up with solutions to this national health crisis that is white supremacy. Uh, uh, and to be sure on that task force or historians, economists, faith leaders, et cetera. I think that that's, that's because then we know that, you know, we're taking this as we have a task force on the environment, ecological crisis and all that. We, with this and all of these things, by the way, interact. I, I think the other thing, you know, there have been, there's a call for reparations. And I certainly uh, believe that reparations are important. But here's, here's the thing, and this is where we have to be driven by another sort of sense of, 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 of justice. That when we talk about reparations in this country, we've talked about trying to repair the breach, right? If you will, the breach uh, that has been created by the uh, legacy that is the, the past, the legacy of slavery, et cetera. And it's created this breach, a breach that is the wealth gap that we, we often hear articulated between uh, black community and, and the white community. And that's a wealth gap that is exacerbating, it's just widening. But we also have to, which is often not named, is, and that is the breach, what I call the choice gap. And, uh, and, and that is, you know, 
each generation, the choices that one generation makes impacts the choices, the options and choices that another generation makes. We come from a people who started out with just limited, say one choice and they made that or two choices and they made the best choice. And if each generation makes the best choice possible, it still means that the next generation is limited, right? Do you follow by the choices that the previous generation has. And so when we talk about the wealth gap and all that, we, we're talking about opportunity gaps. We're talking about choice gaps because we, we don't have the array of choices as a people that uh, people who, who didn't start out in enslavement, who didn't start out being deemed uh, not humans, but chattel, didn't start out there. They have a different all, they have a whole different expanse of choices. So yes, there has to be a way to repair that breach, but the faith community has to call this nation to prepare another breach because the reparations when we're repairing that breach looks like, you know, and, 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 and we should, don't get me wrong, these sort of, you know, money, uh, uh, whether or not we're uh, uh, doing sort of things to uh, build, help people gain wealth and social economic uh, kind of uh, repair, if you will. But here's the thing, we aren't addressing the sin that created the breach in the first daggone place. And so we can apologize, we can throw money at it, and, no, and things just keep on going the way they are, and white supremacy stays intact, and we get our five raisins, but white folks already had 105, so we're never really doing anything but living within a cycle of sin and making that sin a little more palatable, but not doing anything to eradicate the sin itself. Now, sin is a breach. It's a breach between us and God. When we talk about social sin, it's a breach between the way things are and the way they're supposed to be. And so we have to repair the breach between our unjust present and God's just future. And that is about more than simply trying to close a wealth gap and simply trying to close an opportunity or choice gap. It's about changing the systems and structures that got us here in the first place. And that's what we have to begin to call upon our nation to do. If you wanna take seriously, we call it sin, they can call it a health emergency. If you wanna take that seriously, what do you have to do? You have to root out the cause of that in the first place. We aren't doing that. And, and we aren't doing that. And, and how, do, how do we know that we aren't doing that and this stuff just keeps replaying? Well, look what's happening now. We did seem like we just been through this voting thing uh, uh, because we haven't addressed what is at the root of this whole problem. Uh, uh, we haven't taken seriously the systems and structures that were born from the sin of, of white supremacy. So that's, that's, that's the faith community has to, it's a both and thing that at the same time that we're talking about wealth gaps, opportunity gaps, et cetera, what are we doing to make sure that indeed we're closing the gap between the way things are and they're supposed to be, or put it another way in the, in the uh, conversation of, in, in, the, in the language of the politicians. When we call ourselves a democracy in this nation, that's aspirational. If we listen to the people on the underside, we would know that it's always been an aspiration, right? And so we have to close the gap between who we are as a so-called democracy and the aspiration, the gap between who we are and the vision, if you will, of our uh, better angels, right? And so put it in that language for those who aren't a part of the faith community, but the faith that's the faith community's task. And that requires, that's why we need, that's why we need a task force, because that requires the diagnosis of, uh, economists of, uh, of uh, business community, of the faith community, 
of, of others. And the last thing I'll say to speak in practical purposes. So what can we do even, that's a long process and we need to do that. We need to create systems in which if, if, we, if we believe that we don't wanna withhold from another that which we would not want withheld from ourselves, then we need to create a society that doesn't do that. Uh, like, you know, everybody should have healthcare. If you got it, you want healthcare, everybody else should. So let's create a society that we can provide everybody with healthcare. But the immediate thing that we see that reminds us that bodies are, black bodies are trapped in crucifying realities has to do with policing in this country. We're in the middle of this situation right now, right? The uh, George, uh, the uh, uh, Chauvin case, I don't even like to call the man's name, but it's, it's his trial. He's on trial, not George Floyd. Uh, uh, and so the uh, Derek Chauvin case symbolizes the policing in this country symbolizes the problem. And because the problem is this, in a white supremacist nation uh, that is defined by um, anti-blackness, then black bodies are seen as dangerous bodies. Uh, and with little provocation, it's like you can just be walking down the street and people think with little provocation, you're gonna erupt. So they see you as sketchy, as they said in relationship to uh, may his soul rest in peace, Elijah McClain and others. How do we change that policing in this country? Policing is actually doing in this country what it was meant to do uh, as it emerged out of the sinful realities of white supremacy. I think what we do, if we want, uh, we, instead of thinking about policing uh, and policing communities, we have to build just communities. So just communities are safe communities. Just communities are communities that foster life, not death. And you build just communities pro by providing people with the opportunities for life. Right. And so if you do that, if you do that, you're going to have safe communities because they're just communities. Right. Yeah. We have to remove from this notion of policing to what we all say, community respond. Everything don't need a police officer. Again, faith leaders can be a part of this team of responders when you know that you aren't calling a police. You, we know that sometimes you, you need P, you need a uh, a, a social worker, you need, you need a pastor, you, you need a psychologist, you need something else, but you don't need police. Uh, the, the faith community has to lead the way in building the kind of uh, systems of quote unquote, what we call now policing that are built up on the notion of not uh, retributive justice, but the, the notion of restorative justice, restoring justice to our communities so that indeed we can restore the life of a people who have been crucified. And that means shifting our notion of what policing looks like to shifting our focus to building just communities, then we won't need that kind of policing. I'll shut up, I'm way over. <laughs> No, no, no. You are providing us with just absolutely the, the points and the strategies and the ways in which the faith community not just leans into this work, the movement of both repairing and restoring, but we're leaning into how we address the nation, the politics, all of the intersections. So you've raised all of that is important. Um, I'd like to um, just move towards some questions that the audience has for you. And so one of the questions is um, from Donna Van Hook. And she asks, when stating white supremacy is a national crisis, what entity should declare it and how would patriarchy be applied in relationship to the hegemony? Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for your question. First, we should always, un we should understand this. When we're talking about patriarchy, when we're talking about uh, 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 what I call LGBTQ plus terrorism, when we're talking about these systems and structures, these sins that indeed uh, 
dehumanize uh, and uh, other people and don't recognize their sacred worth. We are talking about systems and structures or these sins that really uh, are all a part of this wider kind of piece that we're talking about that we're calling white supremacy. White supremacy doesn't work without othering those people who are not raced white in some way or the other, or as I like to put it, who end up being raced black. Uh, uh, and, and so we have to always hold these things together. Uh, uh, and so, you know, because when we have talked about it in my book, what we're really talking about is what this, what this notion of American exceptionalism, who's the Amer and the Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism, who is it that fits in the category of what it means to be an American, right? And, and, and so it's more than simply people who uh, are, are uh, look like black Americans, uh, but it's people who get put in that, demonized in that same way. Uh, uh, and so who should begin to address this? Who should begin to, to name uh, white supremacy as uh, the uh, health emergency that it is? Well, I think that the faith, faith community has to take the lead in that uh, to, because it is our task to open up the moral imaginary. But in taking the lead for that, we've got to begin to put pressure on things like the National Institute of Health or CDZ, people who do that, you know, the Fauci's of the world uh, that, that, that do that, even as we have to make that a priority uh, uh, on the agenda uh, of, of, our, our, of our president. Uh, but we also, we can't forget the work that is necessary on the local levels uh, to begin to do that. You know, power, Corrupt power and oppressive subjugating power, that does trickle down, right? But change radiates up and it, and it, and it radiates from those people who've experienced the, the, uh, the realities of the unjust power that trickles down. And so we need to begin to uh, take out the legs of the sort of uh, the stool that is holding this up and even on our local level work with those leaders in our communities, be they our elected officials and others, our health, uh, uh, state health uh, what are you, groups uh, to begin to name that. One of the most interesting things to me, and I'll uh, stop here, during this COVID pandemic, which I know uh, many of you also uh, were made aware of, and of course, states were, uh, some were defying it, but uh, telling people uh, the necessity of wearing masks. And what was interesting to me, and I know that this was the case in my home state on Ohio, and I believe it was Oregon where it was also the case, that they suggested that maybe Black people uh, have to think once or twice about, in fact, Ohio for a minute exempted Black people from wearing masks. Why? Because of white supremacy. And said, you know, because they put their lives in further danger. Now, here we are disproportionately impacted by COVID and then can't wear that which will protect us because we are in danger by white supremacy, a health hazard. And so if we began to work with even within our state uh, age, health agencies and began to help them to recognize how it is indeed a health hazard. But I do believe no one's gonna do that on their own and faith leaders, it's our responsibility to begin to raise our voices uh, in this regard. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, we have, I'm gonna, uh, two more questions for you. I wanna not to ignore anyone. We really want the audience to engage. Um, but Marvin Silver is asking a question. Uh, please speak more to the importance of justice being uh, uh, defining the crucifying class and not just our interpretations of the gospel and our privileges. Uh, we've obtained in capitalistic society and for white folks, their privilege. Um, so I'm, is that clear? Yeah, I, I, I guess I'll just, I think I can answer this in brief that, and, and, and we know, you know, that anytime we've enjoyed certain privileges, uh, it's hard 
to recognize how our privilege is based upon somebody else's penalty, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And But it's not hard for the people who have been penalized to recognize the problem. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, it's, you know, even those of us sitting here with this opportunity <laughs> to think and to talk, now, now, now that's a luxury uh, and a privilege. And so, and we're blind to, we, we can't fully see the depth of re things that must indeed change. And so that's, that's what I mean. If, if, if just, 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 just for a moment, it doesn't have to be a moment, it means to be proximate. We have to be proximate to those crucifying realities to understand the complicated, re uh, 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 com complicated realities that they are. And so to be proximate with them and to understand, uh, let me give you one uh, quick example. We can talk about, uh, we know uh, from 10,000 feet up uh, about the problem of lead poisoning in the water, right? And we all, we all know that and we heard about Flint. Some of you uh, may be live in Flint and we heard about Flint and I heard about Flint, et cetera. Wasn't until I went to Flint and spent the better part of, of a week in Flint with the people who had been impacted most by the lead crisis that I understood in a way I never understood before, the complex issues surrounding this. These people said, you know, we've been called useless eaters. And it was not simply a problem of lead. That was the, 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 manif the problem that manifests itself. But the way in which one, the lead poisoning impacted the way their kids could learn in school. Then their kids got suspended because they uh, misbehaved in school. Uh, people were paying for water that they couldn't drink. And then when they uh, didn't pay the bills that went up, to correct pipes that they didn't never see the results of, then they wouldn't pay the bills, their water would get shut off. This is a true story, and not even can't make this stuff up. Then their kids would be taken out of the home because they hadn't provided a safe environment for them. What? You hadn't provided a safe environment for them. Uh, so all of these things, you don't begin to understand the pain and the complex realities until you're proximate with it. And 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 so that's what that's that's what I mean. Thank you. So as we move uh, closer to uh, our closing, there are a couple of questions that I want to condense because uh, we can't get to all of them. Kelly can um, do your answer. I hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to be uh, mindful of the audience has a lot of questions. So I'm going to condense this one uh, because there is this idea of abusive theology and cultural theology, right? And theologies of liberation. So how do we address the abuse in theology? And then that question moves into, um, uh, Dennis Wiley is here with us and wanted to define faith community because many of us come out of diverse faith communities that have a theology that speaks to the liberation and we see God differently than those who are coming out of a white supremacist ideology. Um, and then the last for you is around the deliberate genocide of the pandemic, deliberate genocide. And what do we, how do we do part, how does that become part of the movement? Um, yeah, uh, I, I just, first let me say, wow. And, and good to uh, uh, have a question from you, Dr. Wiley, uh, who is a, I consider a brother uh, and so admiring and respectful of the work that uh, he and uh, Dr. Christine Wiley have done, because that's what I mean between being accountable to a more just future as they certainly were, especially in relationship to the work of uh, LGBTQ plus uh, uh, affirmation and rights. So, Here's the thing we talk about these sort of competing, if you will, theologies and uh, notions of God. 
If we believe that God is love, and if we believe that God is just, then we have to hold ourselves accountable to that belief. And to me, you know, and people say, well, you know, but we have a disagreement on that, of what that might look like. Well, this is why I always start with this. Most faith traditions have some kind of golden rule at the center of that tradition. Uh, this golden rule that reflects the loving, just God. And that golden rule usually goes something like do unto others as you would have them do unto you. What you've heard me articulate all throughout this is what I call sort of the reverse side of that golden rule. Because it's more stinging. Is do not withhold from another that which you would not want withheld from yourself. And if you find that this theology that you are putting forth in any way withholds from another that which you would not want withheld from yourself, well, guess what? It doesn't reflect a just and loving God. To me, that's the way in which we begin to adjudicate these claims as to what is of God and what is not, recognizing that we aren't perfect, but if we just start there. When I talk about faith communities and, and, and all, not all people uh, would do describe their own relationship to that which is greater than themselves as faith. Uh, but I'm, I'm talking about holding ourselves accountable to a greater, a greater vision of what it means to be a sacred child of whomever we call our creator to be. And so that I, I you know, uh, our work, is, uh, well, it's not that we were called to be Christian. It was that we were called to live into uh, what Jesus called the kingdom of God. And so it's not about bringing people to Jesus. It's about bringing people to that which Jesus witnessed to uh, in his ministry and in his embodied reality. The, what was the final question? Um, so, oh, deliberate genocide. Uh, the oh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure what we mean by deliberate genocide. I think racism, white supremacy is deliberate genocide. Uh, right. um, so I'm not quite sure what. So let me go back to the that, question. Mm -hmm. um, so just looking at the ways in which black bodies were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic mm -hmm. and you talked about mask being withheld and we, we're now we, we're faced with um, eliminating the restrictions. Is that a part of the deliberate genocide of black bodies? Here's the thing, as long as we are held captive to the original sin, the culture of sin that is white supremacy, black bodies will always be disproportionately impacted by these kind of realities. And so I think that we have to name, if we wanna talk about deliberate genocide, uh, then we have to name that as white supremacy and uh, the impact of that. And, and that's what we've seen when we talk about these realities that are associated uh, with this COVID pandemic and the way in which we have become, it's sort of like even more trapped uh, in this enigma. So yeah, I think that we don't name the virus as that, we name the original virus, if you will, uh, as that which is white supremacy. And as, and, and as much as we do not address white supremacy, uh, then indeed we are talking about black deliberate genocide. Thank you, thank you. And so um, I'm going to, this is my question for you. Um, you have written extensively and preached extensively and traveled extensively. And so what, how do we engage this next generation? How are we making better choices now? 
because as we saw last summer, that this pandemic is global. The pandemic of racism and white supremacy is global. And that there were young people, people in solidarity, uh, marching for black lives. What choices can we make today as a faith community that engages a very different vision of the church um, moving forward? Because it will be different. Yeah, well, first of all, we need to learn from young people, right? Uh, uh, and here's the thing. When I think Dr. Wiley asked about what do we mean by faith community, what do we mean by church? Mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to call ourselves church, why my goodness, that's aspirational. Uh, uh, and so we need to live into what it means to be church. Church is to be a uh, embodied reality uh, of the vision toward God's more just future. And, and uh, we have to be clear that there is a distinction between being a social institution that happens to be religious and being a church. We need to move beyond trying to sustain ourselves as social institutions and live in to that which we claim to be, which is church. And to be church means to be witnessing for, even as we protest against, uh, those things that stay in the way, that, that obstruct us from becoming the world that, as, as Reverend uh, Blackman started us out, the world that God has intended us to be. And so I think that it's not when we talk about who we are and the next generation and who we're to be to young people, why don't we just try to be in church? And, and that means not all about trying to get them into our buildings. Uh, that actually means going out there where they're being church, where they are being church. I, I, I want to perhaps this probably brings us uh, closer to the end. And here, what I, what I really mean by this, there was a time this past summer uh, when of course we're in the middle of COVID uh, and black lives are, are being decimated and uh, by uh, police violence. And it was post uh, the video of George Floyd's lynching. Uh, uh, and we're on, uh, people are uh, in protests. And I tell you, uh, my faith <laughs> was waning. Uh, uh, and I found myself in this sort of existential crisis of faith, like I had found myself in before uh, I was introduced to James Cone's work of Black Theology of Liberation, because then it was, can I be Black and Christian? And now I wanted to know if the Black Christ was enough. You know, it's one thing to know that Christ is Black, but oh my goodness, uh, this isn't seem, seeming to get us off of the cross. So I went down, I didn't know what to do. It's a true story. And I went down to Black Lives Matter Plaza uh, in DC, here in DC. And when I got down there, I found church. I found, I found the movement of God and my faith was restored. In short, that's what it means to be church. We gotta be church. And if, we do, if we're that, we are not gonna have to worry about the next generation. Thank you, thank you to be church, to be visibly present, to be with people that are holding justice and holding radical liberation in the same hands. Thank you so much, Dean Kelly. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Reverend Blackman. This has been so rich. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dean Kelly Brown Douglas. And thank you also, uh, Dr. Velda Love for your attentiveness to this conversation and so much dialogue uh, from those who have been listening. Um, I, I like to close before asking um, you to pray, Kelly. I wanted to get back to this phrase that you used, uh, this question you asked that I hope we will continue to wrestle with beyond today. Uh, what does it mean to say that we serve a crucified Christ? What does that mean? 
Um, and it, it brought my t it brought my memory back to something that Matthew Williams at ITC posted earlier this week, and I went looking for it because it struck me in the same way your question did. And and what he said was, resurrection is not just life after death; it's living after lynching. Hmm. 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 If I'm honest, I dream of a world where Black life is not dependent upon white cooperation. <laughs> I dream of a world where the indigenous practices of our people replace the indoctrination and the colonization um, that has occupied so much space. And when I hear this conversation, when I hear your words and the exchange, the dialogical exchange, um, I, I hold hope that it is possible, <laughs> that it is possible. So I wanna thank you deeply and go on record as saying you will be back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I welcome, I welcome the opportunity to be engaged together, to think a new world, to Possibly. think a new world, and to dare to dream the dreams that others dare to whisper. That's I, what I think that our young people are reaching for that. Yep, yep. And that and that it is so far removed from our consciousness that, that we, and I say we, I'm 58, right? We um, have difficulty reaching for with them for this black fugitivity, right? Um, I'll leave that because that's a whole different conversation, but thank you. Thank you. Um, and if you wouldn't mind closing us in prayer in whatever way you deem fit in this moment. Yeah, see, you say that because you know I'm an Episcopalian. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and it's like, whatever you Episcopalians deem fit, uh, to deem pray, fit. We, will, we, will, we will try to transform it into a prayer. Uh, <laughs> I got you, Reverend Blackman. Uh, uh, but let us do pray. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has bought us thus far along the way. We ask that you would so draw our hearts, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations and so control our wills, so that we are wholly thine utterly committed to your vision for a more just future where all those of whom you have breathed the breath of life can enjoy that breath and be seen, treated and respected as the very sacred children of yours that they are. Mm -hmm. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has bought us thus far on the way, lead us, we pray, from these crucifying realities of death into the resurrected life that is justice. Yes. Amen. Amen. Amen and ashe. Siblings in Christ, if this conversation has moved you, if what's been offered here has helped enhance your ministry or your soul, 
please consider donating towards the annual fund of the United Church of Christ by texting UCC to 41444. Your support will help programs like this in the essential work of the United Church of Christ. Thank you for your support. Be blessed as you continue your day. Know that you are not alone, and we are holding you in prayer. Amen.